Hi, I'm Tammy Potter, and welcome to the Pregnancy Process Podcast, a show designed to help you navigate the hugely transformative journey to motherhood, where you'll hear the unique experience of experts in this area and the incredible stories of women sharing their conception, pregnancy, and postnatal journeys so that you can have a healthier, more informed pregnancy. In today's episode, I talk to obstetrician, gynecologist, and leading fertility specialist at IVF Australia's Hunter IVF Clinic, Dr. Denise Nesbitt. Dr. Nesbitt's unique combination of education and experience allows her to provide continuing care from conception to cradle, even when this involves IVF or assisted reproductive technology. In this episode, we discuss the intricacies of reproductive health, from recognizing the factors that influence fertility and egg health, navigating the complexities of pregnancy complications and birth methods, to understanding the path to parenthood is a multifaceted one, and why the best path for you will always be one that aligns with your values, circumstances, and health. Dr. Nesbitt, thank you so much for your time today. It's fantastic to have you here with us. Thank you so much for having me. You're so welcome. I'm really looking forward to this conversation, but especially because, you know, you are an obstetrician, you're a gynecologist, you're a fertility specialist. You can take women through their entire journey from conception to birth, which from my limited knowledge is quite rare. And after recently speaking with Emily Angwin, whose conception, pregnancy and birth journey you oversaw and involved a number of hurdles along the way. If it's okay with you, I'd really like to talk about her journey from a medical perspective, starting with egg stores. So I feel like there isn't much education around our egg production, our egg stores, and what things actually affect the health of our eggs. So can we start talking about that? But specifically, how would you go about testing your egg stores and what are you as a fertility specialist looking for when these results come back? Good questions. (laughs) So Emily's journey actually started well before she started to fall pregnant so I think Mm -hmm. that's important that women consider their fertility. Everyone grows up trying to prevent falling pregnant and sometimes don't realise that there may be difficulties. So my first consultation with Emily was really because of an abnormal pap smear and nothing to do with fertility. Because I am so lucky to be able to offer that continuity of care and hopefully a little bit more of a holistic approach in that reproductive journey, it always gives me the opportunity to explore with women what they're intending with fertility and perhaps start some early testing, which is much better to occur prior to pregnancy. So there were a few featured things for Emily and her periods were irregular. So we talked about checking her egg stores. We do that usually by doing a blood test at something called an AMH, which measures hormones in the very tiny follicles in the ovaries. It tells us not exactly how many eggs are there, but it gives us an indication if your egg stores are appropriate for age. It tells us nothing about quality. So for Emily, not only did we find that her eggs numbers were lower, she also had some other medical issues pre-pregnancy that were important to address. She had high blood pressure. She was on a medication that wasn't suitable for pregnancy. She did have a higher BMI, which comes with more risk. Her other screening bloods showed that she wasn't immune to rubella, which is a condition if you contract rubella early pregnancy, can have significant impacts on a baby. So that allows some pre-preparation. We changed her pre-pregnancy vitamins because of the higher BMI. As far as egg reserves, I think a lot of women really don't understand. They think they have these eggs that are just sitting there ready to go. The number of eggs a woman has starts with what she's born with. That number can't increase at all. And it decreases significantly from birth. It even decreases significantly prior to a woman being born. So her egg stores may start at around the 7 million mark when she's a little baby at seven weeks in utero By birth, that has decreased to nearly 2 million. By the time a woman reaches puberty, three quarters of those eggs have gone and you're starting with only roughly 400,000 eggs each month. Hopefully one egg is 
matured and ovulated, but there may be up to another 19 or 20 eggs that were the immature eggs that haven't had the right hormone input to be able to mature, and those eggs are lost. So with time, those numbers decrease. If you're trying naturally, you obviously only need one egg to fall pregnant. So egg numbers are not as much an issue when you start con trying to conceive. Quality is so important. No matter how many eggs you have, as women reach their mid-30s, the quality decreases significantly and we don't have any way of measuring quality. Unfortunately, we don't have any way to increase egg numbers and we, there's no proven evidence that there is any way we can also even improve the quality. However, there are certainly ways we can decrease the quality and that's very important for women to be aware. So lots of lifestyle factors, high BMI, it, again, carrying a lot of extra weight does impact on the hormone balance that is needed to ovulate and it can impact on those egg stores, smoking, alcohol, even pollutants in our environment will impact on the quality of eggs. So it is important, I think, for women to certainly consider and be aware that maybe they can't improve the quality, but they can certainly do things to decrease the risk of decreasing the quality of their eggs. It's a really good point, isn't it? So we need to be focusing on, I guess, maintaining the quality of our fertility rather than having them decrease. Yes. So I've never, I never knew that your egg quantity decreases so much between birth and puberty. Why is that? It is just that even with, with any cells, they mm. just gradually are exposed to lots of different things in the, the environment and it just decreases. I think a lot of women are also not aware that they think, oh, if I go on the pill, I won't release an egg, I'm saving my eggs. That isn't doesn't happen. If you think of the eggs maybe being on this very slow conveyor belt, when they reach the end, they either they have the opportunity if the hormone situation is appropriate for an egg to be released. If it's not, those eggs don't mature and they die. Yeah, wow. Okay. So you can change lifestyle factors to change yeah. these results. So you've mentioned a few factors here. Is there anything else that you can really earmark or pinpoint that affects women's egg health and stores? The most important factor for egg health and stores is really age. You can be a fit, healthy 40-year-old with good egg numbers, but you have 40-year-old eggs. And certainly from 35, that's the reason we see fertility decreasing. We see the miscarriage rate increase because those eggs are 35 or 40-year-old eggs. And women in their 40s Occasionally, some women will fall pregnant spontaneously or will fall pregnant with IVF. However, the majority of women attempting to fall pregnant in their 40s, unfortunately, may not take a baby home. Sad. That's a sad reality, sad. isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, speaking about egg quality, I think it's really important to note here that Emily actually had an incredible outcome with an egg that would typically have been relegated to the discard pile, I think she said. So when it comes to IVF and egg collection, can you explain the process around this and how eggs get graded and chosen? So with the process, and this is where the low egg count becomes certainly relevant with IVF. If you have a low egg count, then we know the number of eggs we potentially are going to be able to collect will be significantly less. We would love to collect 10 to 15 eggs. Emily having a low egg count, we always knew she may need higher dose medication and was lot unlikely to get a large number of eggs. So the eggs are stimulated so that when you have that cohort of eggs, hopefully we create a different hormone environment so that all of those eggs can develop and mature and potentially be able to be collected. We can't see eggs on an ultrasound. We see what are follicles and we can anticipate some of those follicles will have eggs in them. We don't know a lot about the quality of eggs until it comes to fertilisation. And Emily, all her eggs didn't fertilise. Her 
the eggs, the fertilizer is then grown through to embryos, and it was actually the embryo that is then graded on day five oh, rather than the actual right. egg. Okay. And that happens in the laboratory. The grading looks at the embryo and the two sections of the embryo on day five, the part that will make the baby and the part that will make potentially the placenta. So first of all, you need both those parts there and that may give you a number and the quality of those sections of the embryo can then be graded. And obviously, you know, a 5 AA with the best quality potentially will have a higher chance of that embryo becoming a baby. In most of the laboratories now, and certainly in IVF and Hunter IVF, our embryos are underneath what we call the embryoscope. So they're constantly being monitored and AI can also give a score to help predict. If you have two embryos that look the same, which one is more likely to actually achieve a pregnancy? That's amazing. So it is amazing. And that works on calculations on how quickly the embryo has developed into this you know, fancy mathematical formula. Nothing's ever exact. So certainly for Emily, if she had had a better quality embryo, that would have been chosen for transfer. Her embryo that was transferred was obviously suitable for transfer. It wasn't suitable for freezing. Mm -hmm. And because it was the only embryo available, we will still transfer because you want to give every embryo a chance. The chance of that embryo with that grading, however, becoming a pregnancy and a baby was in certainly in single digits. It's amazing, isn't it? The fact that even, even though the chance of that embryo becoming a baby was in single digits, you know, obviously some things you can't explain with science. I just think that's so, so beautiful. You can have such small percentages, but there can still be chances. There's still hope in that. It's still not, not zero. Yeah. So we put an embryo that hadn't been developing or had stopped developing in the laboratory, those embryos, we can be very confident won't continue. You've mentioned BMI limitations around IVF. And I know Emily mentioned IVF light, which is something that you offer up at Hunter IVF. Can we talk about the BMI limitations around IVF light and why BMI is so important in this process and what pregnancy and conception complications can arise due to BMI. Can we talk about that a little bit? Because I think it's really important, especially as a strength coach, health and well-being is what I do and making sure that women are in healthy range BMIs. That's part of what I do and why training is so important in that preconception stage. So can we talk about why it's so important? So I think one point you've just made is that it's very important for women ideally to be in the ideal BMI, BMI range. We talk a lot about high BMI, but we also have to be mindful that very low BMIs also are associated with difficulty falling pregnant. There's hormone imbalances and complications during a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So it's at you know, both those extremes. So in Newcastle, we do offer two options of IVF at Hunter. The LIGHT program is a program that is able to be offered with significantly less cost. So these sorts of clinics obviously do exist in places like Sydney, but they don't usually work side by side with a what we call a premium clinic. There was a huge need. We had women travelling to Sydney to access affordable IVF. So, so LIGHT is really a program that hopefully is a little bit more affordable. The science is exactly the same. So the quality of the embryo and what happens in the IVF process is the same. Where it can be different is that it's protocol driven. It's called light because it's lower stimulation. We're aiming for less number of eggs. If we're aiming for less number of eggs, we can then do an egg collection with local anaesthetic and a little bit of sedation. It doesn't require the cost of a hospital admission and an anaesthetist, but it has to be done safely. And that's where BMI comes into to place. The nurses are doing the scans, the technicality even of doing the scan and the blood test for women with very high BMI can be difficult. The egg collection will be more difficult and, and not as safe. Mm. So that's why that cutoff of 35 has been made. I do find for some, there are some women I see who may never 
realistically achieve a BMI of 35. But many of the women I do see are just over and that can be very motivating for them to look at their lifestyle changes, have an affordable option to proceed with IVF. So can we talk about BMI in relation to pregnancy and conception complications in a little bit more detail. So Mm -hmm. when it comes to conception and pregnancy, why does BMI, obviously in terms of the IVF process, but why does it impact your chances of conception and your chances of maintaining a pregnancy when you do have that and I think let's focus a little bit on the higher BMI purely because yes. when you look at the statistics, I wrote about this recently and the statistics from who, I don't need to explain who who is yes. to you, but for everyone else listening, the World Health Organization in 2022 was, I think off the top of my head, 40% of adults over the age of 18 in 2022 sat in the overweight category and 16% were in obese. So it's important to acknowledge that there are people that are underweight and underweight is just as detrimental to this process as being overweight. But I think the reality is in today's age, so many people are overweight. So I think if we can focus on the overweight side of things, I think that's probably a little bit more relevant. Yes, I agree. The majority of women with BMI issues are in the high BMI. So the high BMI has an impact really back, right back to basics. To fall pregnant, you need an egg you need an egg to be released, you need sperm, and the sperm has to make its way to the egg. For women with high BMIs, there's certainly a hormonal imbalance, which quite often impacts on that very first step, and they're not able to release an egg. Losing sometimes a very small amount of weight can improve the chances of of ovulating. They're also at other increased risks with a pregnancy. They're at increased risk of some congenital abnormalities. So women with high BMI need to be on a higher dose of some of our pre-pregnancy vitamins, in particular folic acid. Most women we recommend taking 500 micrograms, which is half a milligram, would recommend for our obese women to be on five milligrams to decrease the risk of, in particular, spina bifida. Mm-hmm. Our, high, our women with a high BMI are at higher risk of high blood pressure, gestational diabetes, they're difficult even again from a technical point of view to adequately scan the baby to check the weight of the baby the structure of the baby there's also then implications at delivery there's a higher incidence of stillbirth there's a higher risk of cesarean section higher risk of complications with infection and we have to remember the impact on that baby that's born there's also evidence that that baby who has been exposed in utero to these conditions is much more likely to have a high BMI and the complications, heart disease, for example, as they grow up. Absolutely. And the pregnancy journey or the maternal metamorphosis really does impact or has the potential to impact life 10, 20 years down the track as well. So what you're doing at this point and how you're treating your body through this period really does affect so many things later down the track, you know, from your perimenopause journey, your menopause journey, your long-term health factors and key health indicators. Gosh, I couldn't get that out. You know, your health span, your lifespan, all that type of thing. So it is your well-being at this point of your life is so important. But when it comes to pregnancy complications, you have mentioned high blood pressure a couple of times. And Emily faced two pregnancy complications during her pregnancy. One was preeclampsia, which obviously is, I guess, the flow and effect from the high blood pressure. It's not always that way, but there is definitely that correlation between the high blood pressure and the preeclampsia. And then low amniotic fluid. And you can correct me if I'm wrong there, by the way. Can we talk about those two pregnancy complications from a medical standpoint? Why are they both so dangerous? Well, both can certainly, preeclampsia can certainly be potentially a life-threatening condition for both mother and baby. Emily, we knew that she was at high risk of preeclampsia. 
we're now able to screen women at that 12-week ultrasound and actually have a number and a risk. And Emily came up high risk. Does that have to do with the placenta? So that's to do with placenta. Yes, because I remember this from creating the pregnancy process program, but that's now fully in development because a few, I think a few years ago that wasn't being done. So that's incredible. It's still probably not run out completely everywhere across Australia, certainly and across the world. At Newcastle, we offer it for all our women. It means if we detect that someone is high risk for preeclampsia, we can start low-dose aspirin early in the pregnancy and it significantly decreases the risk of that very early severe preeclampsia. So Emily had started aspirin with her other, which we haven't talked about, her blood conditions. That was potentially a little bit trickier, so we did have a haematologist and everyone else involved in that decision-making Knowing Emily was also at high risk, her blood pressure did increase. With her lifestyle changes, she had been on medication pre-pregnancy. She was able to actually stop her medication when she fell pregnant, but we did need to start some medication throughout. So preeclampsia can impact on lots of organs in the body, body, particularly we see, recognise it usually as high blood pressure. Not all high blood pressure is preeclampsia, but it can also impact the kidneys, the liver and other organs. There's a whole range, so things can be relatively mild to, as I said, life-threatening. It can also impact on the placenta. So for these women, we watch the growth of the baby carefully with scans. And one of the first indicators there's an issue with the placenta will be that decrease in amniotic fluid. There can be other reasons for decreasing amniotic fluid. So for Emily, she was developing preeclampsia. She didn't need immediate delivery. Our way we cure preeclampsia is to remove a placenta, but you obviously can't remove a placenta without removing a baby Yeah, and monitoring the baby. So often it's either the mother or the baby may be the trigger. We're always aiming to get as close to term as we can, which often means, as in Emily's case, she was being seen a couple of times a week to try and get her as close to term as possible. And we did manage to get to that 38-week mark. The modern technology these days is just incredible that at 12 weeks, in that 12-week scan, you can potentially earmark that down the track where you may develop preeclampsia and we need to monitor you just that little bit closer. I just think that's amazing. Now, when it comes to preeclampsia, I know Emily faced some difficult decisions around her birth mode. And interestingly, I spoke to another lady on the podcast just the other day, and she had preeclampsia and also had to face a difficult decision around her birth mode, which was to deliver via C-section. And we may talk about this a little bit further because I quite like to get your opinion on this actually, but both of them faced a little bit of, shall we say, backlash. There's still that negative concept around the C-section. So I wouldn't mind talking about that. But first, can we talk about the pros and cons of induction? Because I know Emily was looking at induction or C-section. So can we talk about the pros and cons of induction in this particular instance, or maybe just in general terms, and then also the pros and cons around C-section? So I th- think you have to remember that every pregnancy, every woman, every situation is slightly different. Mm-hmm. So we need to really individualise and help that woman make the choice that's best for her and her family. Mm-hmm. A healthy mother and healthy baby has to always be the priority. I think, unfortunately, sometimes experience, which is very important, comes into that number one spot. And that's where women sometimes are made feel guilty by unfortunately, other women for making the choice that they do. So, so for Emily, her highest priority was, one, her baby was safe and that she was safe. And you also want the experience. It's, I find it really distressing sometimes to see women that have had such a distressing birth story that they're too scared to come back and have another another baby Mm. so we look at the reasons for induction and reasons for for caesar and they they can vary often we're looking at there there may be um, there may be for cesarean section it may be the only safest option if you have a 
it's called a placenta previa and the placenta is coming first, or a baby that is lying transverse or crossways or a cord presenting to attempt a vaginal birth would be catastrophic for the mother or the baby. I think when women do decide to make the decision to go with caesarean, they're often caught with this little bit of conflict that their brain can tell them this makes sense, but they also have to be allowed to have that grief of not having the birth they may have envisaged. So we need to let women know it's okay to feel disappointed. It wasn't what they thought, how they would experience their baby being born. Some pros that come with both induction and Caesar that are actually the same. So some women may request a caesarean section because they want control of timing. And for women that I see who at their first visit are requesting caesarean section, the first thing I do is give them permission if at the end of the day, that's what they want, that will be okay. That really allows me then to explore why they're requesting a Caesar. And sometimes it is because they've their husband works away and they want the guarantee of a date and being able to plan that they may have people in-laws or people coming from overseas and as long as that's at term and not a risk to the baby then we can explore the induction so that can still give them that control of the timing and potentially the vaginal birth that they would have preferred there are with any induction there's always a risk it doesn't go as as planned the majority of women have their cervix is ready and they're being induced for an appropriate reason it should not increase the cesarean section rate the reason with induction maybe the induction doesn't work and a baby isn't going to fit through and it's big we should have some indication hopefully beforehand or a baby develops distress during labor this is where for emily making her decision with the decreased amniotic fluid her baby and the high blood pressure was at higher risk of becoming distressed during labour. As I've alluded to, you want the induction to be successful and work, and that means having an appropriate sized baby in a good position and a cervix that's ready to be able to be induced. We can do lots of things to ripen the cervix, but it can be a slow process. So a woman needs to be involved in some of that decision making. So for Emily, she had low amniotic fluid, her baby was at risk of being distressed during the labour. Unfortunately, her cervix was nowhere near ready, so I wouldn't have been able to break her waters. I wouldn't have been able to do a traditional induction. We could have, over a process of days, used different medications to ripen the cervix, but it's likely there was at least a reasonable chance her baby would become distressed during that process and require emergency caesarean. On the morning of Emily's cesarean, we monitored her baby and there were actually some subtle signs then that her baby would not tolerate labour. When she was getting some Braxton Hicks contractions, the baby's heart rate was slowing down. Mm. So it also made me com you know, comfortable that it was the right decision mm. and a safe decision. There's also plenty of options for pain relief. Some of our women who are deciding induction and are worried about a long labour or they're worried about a force of delivery, we, we can guarantee that doesn't happen. They say, how can you guarantee I don't have a force of delivery? Mm. So I don't put the forceps on your baby's head. And even if full dilatation and caesarean is an option, we can monitor the labour and the progress. So if the labour is not progressing as we would expect, there's always time to you know, reevaluate what's going on. There's also time to reevaluate. Some women may have chosen a caesarean section, but the baby has different thoughts come waters break I've had this this week a lady who had a cesarean section first time for a, a baby that was distressed during labor her plan was for a repeat cesarean section her waters broke a little over four weeks early so a smaller baby in a good position so we re-evaluated what to do and she's actually had a beautiful vaginal birth so things can always always change yeah sometimes sometimes the babies have other ideas right <laughs> And there's not really a right or wrong. There have been some very good studies suggesting that, which was probably surprise a lot of people, if we induced women at 39 weeks, we decrease the caesarean section rate, we decrease the stillbirth rate, and we decrease sick babies in the nursery. It doesn't mean everyone needs to be induced and everyone can make those, those choices. But there are some pros. It's not all just cons. A woman does have a cesarean section you've got to think about not only this pregnancy but the next pregnancy 
if a woman's had a cesarean section, her next pregnancy does potentially have some further complications. She may have a placenta that implants incorrectly and there's increased risks. Most women now don't have huge families, but there is a limit to how many cesareans you can have. So if a woman came to me and said, I'm planning eight to 10 babies, I would do whatever I could to avoid doing that first cesarean. If she said, I'm having one baby, I really don't want any risk to my pelvic floor or any damage, then a cesarean section may be the appropriate choice for her. It's nice to hear that there are some pros to induction. How do I say this? I have, maybe because of the type of work that I I do and the area that I specialise in, I typically get a lot of women that have not had very positive induction experiences that have ended up in in forcep deliveries and that type of thing. So, but it's nice to hear that there are some positive outcomes to the induction experience. Now, in terms of what I was talking about before with the C-sections getting a bit of a bad rap. And I feel like this can maybe even be stretched to obstetricians themselves. And I'm sure you probably have some opinions on this or might even like to voice your perspective on this. But I feel like C-sections get a bad rap sometimes. Obstetricians themselves get a little like not maybe a bad rap but I guess people might see that they're all about interventions and surgery can I get your thoughts on this well I agree with a lot of those comments I say to my patients if I'm an obstetrician I'm actually your insurance policy I'm not your baby catcher obviously we catch the baby over the years and I've been doing obstetrics for a long time certainly things have, have changed the cesarean section rate has increased significantly, but we also see less sick babies, so there's positives and, and negatives. You really need to probably hopefully trust your obstetrician. You get to know them during your pregnancy. Everyone will have different expectations and plans on how they would like their birth process to, to go. I'll often to say to some women, too, even the, the lady this week I was talking about who had a vaginal birth, even though she was planning a cesarean after I said, I say to her, it's actually more work for me to monitor you during the labour, deliver your baby, then go to theatre for 30 minutes. So the majority of obstetricians, I hope, have their patients and babies' welfare is number one. But there sometimes are other pressures. I think that may indicate that some may have higher intervention rates. Mm. Yeah, certainly cesarean, and, and as you said, it does tend to get a bad rap. Women get... And it's often other other women who make women feel guilty that they haven't laboured spontaneously, they haven't had a vaginal birth. Whether that has been a safe option or not, it doesn't really come into play. I also find some women who've actually had a really good experience find they can't often talk to other women and say, oh, my labour was great, it was quick, because they're also put down by women because how dare you have a good experience So it's those bad stories that you always hear. A lot of women probably forget how lucky we are in Australia with our health system and our maternity care. I have done some work overseas in in Laos where the chance of women dying, if we had women dying at the rate here, people would be absolutely horrified. It's hundreds and hundreds of women a year die there. So our intervention really should only ever be for the safety of the mother or baby. At least that's how I practice obstetrics. That's either avoiding physical but also psychological harm as well for for those women. I think that's very important. So the whole mental health aspect of, let's just say, a forceps delivery or a a long drawn out labour that ends in a forceps delivery or choosing to have a C-section because you have anxiety or that the idea of giving birth is causing you a lot of mental anguish because you don't know the path. I think the mental health aspect of giving birth really can't be discredited on the mum and how she enters the next stage of her life and how she connects with her baby, which is really the most important thing, that mother-baby diet and making sure that they are 
healthy together as a unit. So I think at the end of the day, that is exactly what you're saying is the most important point is making sure that the health of the mum, the health of the baby from a physical, mental and emotional aspect is the most important thing. And anything else, any other birth mode, the birth mode or how we got to that point shouldn't really matter at the end of the day. And I think we should all just be supporting women irrespective of their choices that they're making or that they're being forced to make because some women may have really wanted a vaginal delivery and they've had to have a C-section and they then have to process the fact that their delivery didn't go the way that they wanted to. And that can cause some emotional distress as well. But in terms of the C-section rate, so I've made a few notes here, (laughs) if that's okay. So in terms of the C-section rate, do you think part of the reason why it's increased is because of increase in our knowledge base as women? So we're just a little bit more educated around the potential effects of a long drawn out labor. You know, technology has increased. We're able to do amazing things like check at 12 weeks whether you may possibly develop preeclampsia. Do you think that's part of the reason why that rate has increased so much? It's probably a combination of things, as you said. I think also women delaying their first baby, they're having less babies. They are sometimes now given that choice and they may look at their even the mothers who are experiencing prolapse and complications from difficult births and they want to avoid that for themselves, Mm -hmm. are more knowledgeable. Women are also now certainly given permission to make that that choice. Caesarean section also over the years has become much safer. When I started obstetrics, we always said, oh, caesarean section's more dangerous to the mother. In, in fact, the if you look at the, the risk of, of dying, having a baby, it's no different whether you have a caesarean section or a vaginal birth. There are certainly more complications from an emergency caesarean or a caesarean in, in labour. And that's why women, if you really believe their chance of delivering vaginally is fairly low, you need to have that, I believe you should have that discussion with women so she can be part of that that choice which she wants to go the women who are often really traumatized are these women that have long long drawn out labors they haven't got the continuity of care during their labor they have a difficult either a very difficult vaginal birth which can take much longer to recover from than a straightforward caesar sometimes even during the labor they haven't been offered that option to to make that choice throughout that process talking about long drawn out labors Can we talk a little bit about forceps? Yes. I'm like, can we? (laughs) So can I just ask, I mean, I understand that in an emergency situation where you really need to get the baby out, that is the way that you can potentially get it out the quickest. It's more effective than, say, using vacuum. But... The, the harm that they do to the women's pelvic floor at some stage is almost irreversible. These things, the, the design of them haven't really changed since they were developed back in the 1800s. Can I ask, why are we still using this method? Mm-hmm. So there's still are, are times we need, as you said, to use forceps if you have a baby that is really distressed, that the heart rate's low. If you don't deliver that baby quickly, you may not have a live baby. Mm -hmm. We, for our assisted deliveries, we really aim in the majority of cases to use the long twos over forceps. We also use forceps at caesarean section. People might not be aware of quite often too. (laughs) (laughs) Obviously that does no damage to the pelvic floor. That they're a, di- a different set of forceps. But in the, most hospitals now, I think forceps would certainly be used far less than a vacuum. If there's no fetal distress and it would be a difficult forcep delivery, most of those women now would probably be advised even to have a caesarean section rather than a difficult forcep delivery. We no longer do what are called high forceps or these rotational forceps, so things have improved. The design may not have changed, there's probably not a lot you can do about the design changing. The 
use of the von twos though has certainly increased and that decreases some of the pelvic floor trauma with a force of delivery too it often happens much more quickly you don't have time for the perineum to stretch so even the sound of an episiotomy sounds awful but it does decrease the risk of a, a tear a third degree tear down to the anus and all the complications that potentially come with that do you have any advice for women how you can avoid having them used in your delivery well i think talk to your caregiver mm-hmm. if yeah as i said the only way you can have a forceps delivery is someone puts forceps on mm. so you can be very clear and say i'm not i don't if it comes to a forceps delivery i'm not happy to have a forceps delivery and i would respect those women's choices the only thing i would say to them if it was a situation where it was life and death see if your baby would you recon and, and most women i think they end up having enough trust that they know that it, it would only be those sorts of situations. And, and that's not very often. Mm. There are some women who, however, say their focus is so much on a vaginal birth, they don't care whether they have horses or what they have because they want a vaginal birth. So you again have to respect their wishes. That doesn't mean you should ever do a difficult forceps that's going to put the baby or the mother at risk, even though that might be, we might say, I want forceps rather than a cesarean if it's not safe. We should never put those forceps on. Thank you for answering that. I know I've gone a bit off piste with that question. I just kind of snuck it in there. So I I appreciate you answering that. Women are more aware of their pelvic floor and the damage babies can can do. Yeah, I think so. And I think that comes back to the knowledge that I was talking about before and potentially why the C-section rate has increased a little bit because they are concerned about their pelvic floors and rightly they should. You know, I've certainly worked with enough women who've had some pretty severe damage to their pelvic floor. So, you know, anything that we can do to protect a woman's pelvic floor is going to be so much better for their quality of life, their mental health, their relational health, all that type of thing. So I think it is really important. It, in terms of, and I know we come kind of continuing on the C-section route, but do yeah. you have any tips for women on how to have a more empowered C-section? Obviously with the decision, mm-hmm. that may mean giving them permission to be disappointed it's a cesarean, being comfortable that, and it's usually fairly standard now, obviously that the partner or support person will be with the mum throughout the cesarean section. Majority of cesarean is rare to require, for example, a general anaesthetic. So mums are awake and can be involved with the delivery. And I think they can feel empowered in that way. We, even with my anaesthetist, one of the important things is to make sure they've got their playlist sorted out. So if there's a particular music they want to make it as comfortable and the environment comfortable and safe, it's obviously still a medical procedure, but if we can demedicalize it a little, encouraging that babies, that mums have skin to skin straight away, their babies stay with them unless there's a need to go to the nursery. And sometimes, unfortunately, there will be. So the mother and the baby are in recovery together. It should not impact on their breastfeeding and just allowing that woman to have some control, as much control as they can of those choices. Mm. And Emily mentioned that she reached down for her yes. baby, which would be, which would probably be classed as a maternal assistant C section. Yes. Is that something we're moving more towards having done? And how would you go about having a choice to do that? Obviously, it was an act. She just kind of did it. She was saying she just did it. But is there some way that you could? talk to your healthcare providers and say, is there a chance to do a maternal assisted? I think it's always worth that discussion. And then it's worth with the woman getting a feeling of what she believes a maternal assisted Caesar is. The risk is always that we're working in a sterile field and then as someone reaches over, you then increase the risk to that woman of infection and complications. So it is that fine balance right yes and emily's wasn't planned but when it happened it was intuitive that if you taught the baby i could still maintain my sterile feel it was safe and and that's probably and it was actually a beautiful delivery hospitals that have procedures in place often insist on the mothers have gloves on and they've oh, got drapes over them to me that seems a little less natural 
then they, we always drop the drape so the mum sees the baby being born. The baby comes straight around to the mother that, and they can have skin to skin. With some of the maternal assisted deliveries, they're not really getting skin to skin or they're touching the baby with, with gloves on. Mm. So I think you need to talk to your provider about what you think a maternal assisted Caesar is, what they offer. And also it's no good having a beautiful delivery and then a mum with a dreadful wound infection who can't breastfeed. That is so true, isn't it? I totally agree with that. Now, I've got one or two more questions for you. I'm going backwards up my list. So we're going to revert back to egg quality, if that's okay. Now, I just had a thought in terms of egg quality and how this could potentially affect children later on in life. I have no idea about this whatsoever, but it just popped into my head that would egg quality affect a child later on in their life in terms of their health and well-being? Overall, egg quality is always important, but often it's a complete, you know, it's either a healthy baby or no baby. Mm-hmm. So the egg quality, if you have been able to achieve a pregnancy, obviously babies can be born with genetic problems. That's not really the quality. That's down to the genetics of the parents. There is some evidence which is getting away from egg quality, but sperm quality has decreased significantly. And there is some evidence that if you impact that microenvironment of hormones, and that could be simple, something as simple as a lot of work being done on, on these microhormones, and one is large quantities of soy milk may actually impact on a male fetus and their potential sperm production as an adult. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? I'm a soy drinker, but I've had so many people being like, oh, you shouldn't drink soy. (laughs) That's that's of course some of the evidence now because it's a very weak phytoestrogen. It does change hormone balance both in women and... How much soy would you have to drink for that? It's actually not as much as you you think. So we certainly at the conference when this particular, it doesn't call it, Andrew Pascal talks, we all go out for our coffee break The soy milk that is normally always drunk sits there untouched for the rest of the conference. Gosh, okay. So maybe I need to be rethinking my coffee of choice. Microplastics are probably worse than the soy. Okay, that's good to know. So it can come down to more sperm quality than egg quality. That's really good. It's great to hear that it's more genetics than the actual quality of the egg, which then links back to the fact that Emily had an egg whose quality was potentially going to be discarded if there were other better options there. She still managed to have a beautiful baby girl who is now very bouncy and healthy and that the quality of that egg back when it was chosen actually has nothing to do with her long-term health and lifestyle factors and that it's more to do with the genetics so with Emily, obviously she had the quality of the egg, but it was the it was the embryo that was the lower quality. Sorry. So often the low quality eggs never become mm-hmm. embryos; they don't fertilize. So they're self selected. But the quality of the embryo doesn't impact on if a, if a pregnancy continues and you have a healthy baby, it's not going to impact on that child. The poorer quality embryos are more likely to maybe miscarry or not implant right from the beginning mm, okay thank you I know you've you've corrected me twice on that so right. I apologize right. I, like, I'll get that into my brain now it's the quality of the embryo not yeah. the actual egg and that poor quality eggs typically don't even develop or yeah. turn into an actual egg so now that I have that clear I won't make the mistake again but I have one final question for you if yeah. that's okay and that would be what's the one thing that you wish all women knew before having a baby if you could boil it down to one thing what would it be very hard to boil it down to one thing isn't it I guess women just need to know it's probably going to be the most hopefully the most amazing thing they ever do in their lives my advice is you'll be given so much advice from so many people I say to my women listen to everyone agree with them and do what feels right for you because you usually can't get it wrong Oh, that's amazing. Listen to everyone and just do what feels right to you. Like just smile and nod, say thank you, and then just go (laughs) suityourself.com. Oh, you you know, by some you may take, every baby's different. 
it, I've had four children. What worked for one may not have worked for another. As long as they're, they're happy, they're fed, they're clean and they're dry. That's amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. And I know I've gone off piste here with a couple of my questions. So I really appreciate you taking the time and having patience with me while we answer them. Have you got anything else that you'd like to say? Not really. I'm just very privileged to have the the job and the life that I that I have. Mm, amazing. It, it must be very rewarding what you do. It is to, with Emily, to think you hold this tiny microscopic embryo in your hands, put it into a uterus and then deliver a baby. It's quite incredible. Mm, it's definitely rare. I don't know many people that have that continuity of care. So thank you so much for your time today. It's been incredible. And if you're hearing this message, I want to say a huge thank you because it means that you've listened to this entire episode. Of course, if you have any questions about the things that we covered in this episode or want to know more about me or my other projects, you can find me on YouTube and Instagram at The Pregnancy Process. For those currently in their conception or pregnancy journey, you can apply to join my complimentary but private community, The Preggy Training Crew. And you'll find my community application and social media links in the episode description. And of course, if you enjoyed this episode, I absolutely encourage you to share it with other women just like you. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.